We are uh, in the letter to the church of Pergamum. Last week we got down to about verse, we'll start in verse 14. or Actually, let's start reading in verse 12. We'll get down to verse 14 just so we kind of catch up to where we are. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in, in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Now, I want to stop there for just a second because I want us to go back into 1 Corinthians and look at what Paul teaches the church in Corinth about eating food sacrificed to idols. So turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And beginning in verse 4, Paul says, So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols... We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their confidence is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. Uh, We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that you exercise your freedom, or that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. And I'm, I'm just going to stop right there. Tell me, kind of in a nutshell, what Paul's teaching is about food sacrifice to idols there. It's okay to eat it as long as they don't tell you it's sacrificed to idols. Okay. Then they'll do it. I think that's what he said in Romans 14. Okay. In a, in a way. Uh, that's similar to what he says in, in Romans 14. Any other? Turn over to chapter 10, beginning in verse 23. He says, Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this meat has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it. Both for the sake of the man who told you and for the conscience's sake. The, the man's conscience, I mean, the other man's conscience, I mean, not yours. Uh, for why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I t- take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So... What is it about meat sacrificed to idols? What's the rule? Can we eat it or can we not eat it? Okay. Give me an example. I'm asking the question here. So you said you knew the answer. So. Well, I didn't say I really knew. <laughs> I thought I knew. Somebody give me 
another example. That's a good example, but I'm just, I don't think we're using the right thought process. But in today's world, if someone's doing something you don't believe in, mm -hmm. that shouldn't be a stumbling block to you to reach out to that person. Okay. But they shouldn't draw you into doing something that's wrong. Okay. Okay. If they make it aware to you that it's too mild, you're not to eat of it, <coughs> because that would be sending the wrong message. Okay. Uh, there, uh, too. And 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 that's really kind of what it comes down to. Let's. And, and how many of you know a place where you can buy meat sacrificed to idols today? Anybody? So, so this is one of those things that is kind of foreign to us because we're not going to be in this situation. So let's let's try to think of the situation. And this is the way I understand what Paul is saying. You go to somebody's house and they serve you meat. And it, you can eat the meat. There's nothing at all wrong with, with eating meat. But if they tell you, you know, this is you know going to be really good meat because it was sacrificed to the God of so-and-so. And so it's kind of a blessed or kind of a holy meat now. Then if you eat that meat, then you're kind of going along with their beliefs. But if you say, you know, I, I can't eat this meat because I don't believe in that God or I don't worship that God, then your conscience is still clean. Now the question comes, have you offended that other guy? Possibly. So, so you know, it, it, it seems like what Paul is saying is, it, if the meat doesn't mean anything to you, th then eat it. Because it's just meat. But if it has that special significance to it, then you shouldn't eat it. Carl. That's right. They don't mean anything. Right. So, even if, okay, I'm at, I, I guess I'm posing this as a question. Even if the meat, you knew it was sacrificed to the God, that God doesn't mean anything. There's only one God. Right. Are you still, outside of, 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 of messing with someone else's conscience that sees you do this, that, that's weak and falls there, yeah. and you're strong because you know that there's only one true and living God? Right. And that sacrifice to that God doesn't mean anything. It's just still me. Can you still eat that meat? See, I think it, as long as it doesn't mean anything to you, you're fine to eat it. Right. But if it means something to your host, yeah. there you go. And, and I think, you know, when we read this, I don't, I, I think there were some Christians who were still, that that meat still had a significance to them. And that's, I think Paul is probably dealing with that situation there. Uh, that if you are sitting down with your brother or sister who is making a big deal of this meat sacrifice to idols, then you need to kind of set an example for them that, hey, we don't, we don't do that anymore. So if the person is not a Christian, but they, they, they sacrifice this meat to one of their gods, mm -hmm. I guess the issue is how it affects other Christians. If they're a, a, a Christian that's not as strong as you, mm -hmm. and, he, and it bothers his conscience that you're eating this meat sacrifice, that's that's where you have the issue. Yeah. But what about the guy that is, let's say he's a pagan, right? And you go over to his house and he sacrifices, and you know that it doesn't mean anything to you, right? But this guy. That's a that's a bigger question there. Yeah. So how does that translate into the day for Well, the the, the example that I mean no sacrifice to idols, but right. it has to mean something. Well Greg's got an example. <laughs> <laughs> you had your hand up, dude. I, <laughs> I don't know if it's an example or if it's just uh, a response. I think it's a matter of encouraging false doctrine. Yeah. Encouraging someone they believe something is to be accurate, but you know the truth mm -hmm. according to the Bible, which we shouldn't compromise, then 
if we if he says it is meat that's been sacrificed to idols and you eat it, then you're encouraging him along false paths. Right. That's for the pagan or somewhat the non believer. But for the believer, if you eat something that's sacrificed to idols, then that could become a stumbling block for him when they know that it's not proper mm -hmm. to eat something that's sacrificed to idols. We know that God made it all, and there's nothing wrong with eating any of it. But if someone has that belief that this is something that should be sacrificed to idols, and we should not eat it, and we do eat it, then what is that? What kind of a message do you send? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the whole point here that Paul is making. Is, is, yeah, you've got your conscience, but you know the truth. But what, is, what message do you send to the other people? Mm -hmm. You know, being a believer or a non believer. Right. You know, and I think that also, you know, applies to the day soon. Um, if we if we go out and we're drinking and partying and we are Christian, we say we are Christian, what kind of message are we sending to the world? You know, and, and I think that's what I think mm -hmm. that's what Paul is. That's my interpretation, if you will, of what Paul is saying. Okay. Me, it's not like if I'm if you're Baptist you know, he wants me to teach, you want me to teach you the gospel, and I teach you everything but the baptism, then I'm doing it wrong. I have to teach him the full gospel mm -hmm. in order to, to teach him the gospel. I can't leave out something that he disagrees with. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know whether that's exactly or not, but we could be guilty of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but we teach by example, sometimes by a word of what he's talking about here. Mm -hmm. Leave it alone until it comes to false worship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it, this is one of those situations where uh, do, how many of you know someone who worships another god? You know, so these are things that are just, and, and what we do is we will we'll translate it into us versus Baptist or Catholics or somebody else, but it's it's really not quite the same thing here because those guys aren't worshiping false gods. And they're not doing stuff, you know, to offering to other gods. And so it, it really, I think it, it does get difficult. We, we try to find a way to make it fit in our society, but it doesn't fit 100%. You know, one of the things that I think about uh, but it, it, but again, this my example doesn't really fit this pattern either. But one of the things I, I thought of as we were talking about this is, let's say, for instance, you get an invitation to attend a homosexual marriage in a church. What do you do? But see, again, that doesn't necessarily... In some ways it fits this because if these people are claiming to be Christians then your your example is going to instruct or maybe be a stumbling block to them. If they're pagans and they don't care anyway, then you say, well, why are you getting married in a church in the first place? But, uh, but anyway, so again, that example in, in our society today doesn't fit this exactly. I don't know that we really have anything that fits it exactly. But in Pergamum, they were struggling with this same thing because in Pergamum there were some in the church who were being drawn back into eating food sacrificed to idols in a way that Jesus says is wrong. They weren't doing it as if the idols didn't mean anything. Evidently they were doing it as if the idols did mean something and did have some power. Maybe they were doing it just so that they could continue to fit in with society and not rock the boat. And in, in back into my illustration, you know, I think one of the reasons that the homosexual agenda has gotten as far as it has is because Christians for a long time have just decided we're not going to rock the boat. We'll just kind of go along. And we've kind of gone along with a lot of things that we shouldn't have gone along with. And uh, But... So I think in some ways that does tie in. But the church, there were some in the church in Pergamum who were doing this in a way that, that like I say, 
was going to bring down the wrath of, of Jesus. I mean, he says, you know, you don't stop doing this, I'll show up with my double-edged sword and make war with you. Uh, and he says that these people are following the teachings of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. How many of you actually read the story of Balaam and Balak in Numbers this week? Okay. Uh, I had you read chapters 22 or 24, 20, what did I have you read? 24, 25? 22 through 24? In that reading, did you ever come across a place where Balaam told Balak to entice the, the Israelites? Anybody? Well, that's the correct answer, is that that never happens. Uh, and I'm not going to go through and, and recount the whole story, but... Balak wants Balaam to prophesy negatively against the Israelites. He wants him to uh, basically put a curse on the Israelites. And every time, Balaam says, let me go to God and ask God what he wants me to say. And God, every time, has him bless the Israelites and point out that they are going to be victorious. They are going to overcome. Never does Balak get what he wants because he wants to defeat the Israelites, but he never gets that prophecy or that oracle from Balaam. Uh, it goes back four different times. Uh, in chapter 22, 23, well, in chapter 23, we have the first, second, and third, fourth oracles, and then at the end of verse uh, chapter 24, you have these final oracles uh, to the Amalekites or to uh, uh, Amalek to the Kenites, and uh, then just kind of a random one. But, but never does Balaam say to Balak, well, why don't you just go entice these guys? But if we read over in chapter 25, Numbers chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the Baal at Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. The Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of these people kill them and expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's anger or the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to Israel's judges, each of you must put to death those of your men who have joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor. So even after Balaam prophesied good on Israel's behalf, the men of Israel began to commit these acts, worshiping the foreign gods, having sex with these Moabite women. Uh, why did they do that? Well, turn over into Numbers chapter 31. In Numbers chapter 31, uh, beginning in verse 15, have you allowed all the women to live, he asked them. They were the ones who followed Balaam's advice and were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord in what happened at Peor, so that a plague struck the Lord's people. Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourself every girl who has never slept with a man. So in Numbers chapter 25, these women enticed the Israelite men, and who encouraged them to do that? <clears throat> Read verse 16. Yeah, they were following Balaam's advice. Uh, look also over in chap or chapter 31 again the first eight verses the Lord said to Moses take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites 
After that you will be gathered to your people. So Moses said to the people, Arm some of your men to go to war against the Midianites and carry out the Lord's vengeance on them. Send into battle a thousand men from each of the tribes of Israel. So twelve thousand men armed for battle. A thousand from each tribe were supplied from the clans of Israel. Moses sent them into battle. A thousand from each tribe among, with, along with Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the priest who took with him articles from the sanctuary and the trumpets for signaling. They fought against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every man. Among their victims were Evi, Rikim, Zur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, son of Baor, with the sword. So even though in chapters 22, 23, and 24, everything we hear coming out of Balaam's mouth is good for the Israelites, evidently he went behind God's back and encouraged Balak to have his women seduce the Israelite men. And he was killed for it. And he was blamed for what took place. So we don't have the actual account of him doing this, but evidently that's what he had done. And so that's why in Revelation chapter 2 it says they're following the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. Uh, the, the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, we don't know exactly what their teaching was, but both of them in some way were enticing believers to just assimilate and accept whatever the social norms were. Whatever kind of immorality, whatever kind of false worship uh, was going on, that's what these teachings were, were doing. And so in verse 16, Jesus says, Repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, for those who say that the sword represents the word... And, and you limit it just to that. Is Jesus just going to come and speak to him? you think? No. This sword is a military symbol. In fact, the, the language when he says, I will come and fight against them. Does anybody's translation have something other than fight in verse 16? Make war. Make war. And that's really... The, 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 I think the more powerful translation, I mean, DJ and Jerry are going to fight on the 19th, not each other, but they're, well, of course, they'll probably do that this afternoon, but uh, they're both uh, fighting an MMA fight coming up, but there's that, that's fighting, but then there's war, which is worse, war. And uh, that's what Jesus says that is, that is going to happen. In Revelation, this kind of language <clears throat> often is directed against Satan uh, or Satan's attackers on believers. If you turn over into chapter 12, verse 7, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. There's a lot of war language that goes on in Revelation, and it's always between God and his soldiers against the dragon, the beast, the devil, and his soldiers. Over in chapter 19, verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider was called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. Uh, over in chapter 11, verse 7. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. That word for attack there is make war against them. Uh, chapter 12, verse 17 is another place. The dragon was in, enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. 
You know, this is this ongoing theme, uh, chapter 13, verse 7. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Uh, Over in chapter 20, verse 8. Uh, Beginning in verse 7, when the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out uh, to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for war or for battle. So that's, that's the big theme throughout Revelation is this battle between God and Satan. And so Jesus says that he will come and that there will be war against the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans, but also that, but but that's also going to affect the rest of the church. And one of the, you know, Jesus tells the church to repent because they're tolerating these. They've got them among them, and so there's going to be some war also against those who refuse to practice the biblical virtue of intolerance. The church cannot tolerate this kind of stuff. I want to read you a quote from from Dr. Oster in his book that I think is uh, very kind of powerful. He says, Although it is quite shocking to followers of Christ, both ancient and modern, the militarism of Jesus will apparently vanquish erring Christian believers who have abandoned first commandment loyalty and those who tolerate them just like it will vanquish the beast and the false prophet. Those who do not adhere to you shall have no other gods before you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Those that don't hold to that Christ will come and make war against them. Even Christians, even those in the church. And those that just tolerate that stuff. Christ will come and make war with them. Uh, As harsh as that sounds, that's kind of the way God has done things throughout history. And next week I want to give you some some examples because I think that's a very important lesson for for us to learn. We tend to to get this kind of Pharisaic Jew, Jewish mentality. Well, I've been baptized. I, I attend the Church of Christ. I'm good to go. But Revelation tells a very different different story. Are there things that we tolerate, even within the church, that are unbiblical? That are against what God has ordained? Do we tolerate those to fit in with society? To just kind of get along with everything? And, And it really ought to concern us. In fact, I just almost didn't show up this morning. (laughs) Uh, But it it really ought to give us pause and to reflect on whether we are really being faithful to God. So we'll, we'll finish up this letter next week. So read through the letter of Pergamum, uh, the letter to Pergamum again. And uh, you might want to start reading the one to Thyatira. I'm not sure if we'll get into that next week or not. But thank you for the class.